Let's come together again tonight and we will do Psalm 48, God willing, unless you have something else in mind. We may get to Psalm 119 or a portion of Psalm 119 in case you need that handout, it's at the back. And before we do, as always, let's pray, give thanks, ask for lots of help and see which way the wind blows tonight. Our Lord and our God, eternally the same, always reaching out to us, always wanting to draw us to you, making us to be saved and to join with you always. For all these millennia, you have put up with so much violence. You've put up with so much hatred, and anger, and yet still work with us to bring us to your peace. And certainly the Psalms that we see and read and the histories that we read are filled with our violence, your reaction to it, or shall we not say your reaction, but your plan as you shape us towards you. So please help us to see it tonight, to understand it more tonight, and to come to love you ever more fully, and then turn to you in prayer, expressing our gratitude to you for the wonder that you are. Through Christ our Lord we pray, amen. All right, so back to Psalm 48, where we just briefly started. Uh, I won't cover all of the background again since we started to cover that last week. For those who follow on tape, you'll find that background uh, and the tape that's labeled Jeremiah 31 verses 10 to 14. And it'll give you just a little bit of the detailed background of the invasion of Sennacherib to, uh, to uh, Jerusalem. But for now, we'll, we'll come back and we'll review it just slightly as we review Psalm 48. As we mentioned last week, that there are these three psalms together, Psalm 46, Psalm 47, Psalm 48, that form a group. And they appear to be giving thanks, uh, rejoicing before God for his deliverance in a very specific case, in the deliverance from, of, of Jerusalem under Hezekiah from the Assyrians. We mentioned how under Hezekiah there had been a great revival, that there was certainly the, um, the, the threat of destruction before that, Hezekiah comes along as a young king, and he reinstitutes the worship of God and rids the country of the worship of Baal. Eventually, he does pass away, the kingdom falls again, and there's a second revival under Josiah. That will come later in history. Um, but this one is under, under Hezekiah, a very, very righteous king, and yet one living in a very oppressive time. So in Hezekiah's lifetime, we saw it said that, that uh, Assyria had come down and had taken the entire nation of Israel captive. They were gone. All that was left was the southern kingdom of Judah. And then Israel was coming, uh, uh, Syria was coming down again, invaded in the north, and had come to the very gates of Jerusalem. Right? We had the Reb Sheikah and all these other Assyrian officials who were uh, speaking to the people in Hebrew, in, in the, the language they can understand, to tell them that God was not going to deliver them. Where are the gods of all these other people we have conquered? Don't listen to Hezekiah. No one's going to deliver you. You know, surrender to us and we'll take you off your land and we'll take you someplace else. Otherwise, we're going to wipe you out. You know, and he mocks God that, you know, can't deliver uh, the, uh, the nation of Judah from the king of, of Assyria. And Hezekiah is deeply troubled by this. And he turns to God. He actually takes the letter that he's given uh, as this threat, these terms, and he takes it into the temple and spreads it before God and, and prays. And, we're, and Isaiah comes and tells him there is going to be deliverance. And indeed, 185,000 of the Assyrian army are wiped out overnight. And that raised some hackles, as, as it might, last week as we discussed that, that why does God do this? Why did God just wipe out 185,000 human beings? And it's a valid question to ask raises some fundamental questions for us. And we examined those last week. We examined them in the second half of last week, and it's good to review them again. That in this case, we do see a case of God defending the oppressed from the oppressor. All right, so you have the nation of Judah. They haven't been an aggressor. They haven't attacked Assyria. Just Assyria wants to come and take them captive and keep steamrolling over them just like it has over other kingdoms. So you have this oppressor coming down to the relatively innocent oppressed and God acts. He delivers. He wipes out this 185,000 person army. Sennacherib goes back and he's actually assassinated when he returns. 
But sometimes God doesn't do that. Sometimes he lets the oppressor oppress. And so it makes us wonder what's going on with this capricious God who sometimes delivers and sometimes doesn't, who sometimes rewards the just and other times they suffer, and it seems the wicked prosper. In fact, we'll see this a lot as a theme throughout the Psalms as they muse and wonder and sometimes are disturbed by the seemingly inconsistent behavior from God. And yet God tells us that he is consistent, that indeed he lives out of time, outside of time. He doesn't change, right? Change is a function of time. And so it helps us to hopefully come to ourselves and understand that God is going to look at life with a different set of priorities than we are. You know, I might liken it to sometimes maybe we have um, a company we work for and they start laying off people and maybe cutting back hours and cutting back benefits. And we're likely to think, oh, greedy owners, capitalists, they're just, you know, at the expense of all these other people, they're lining their own pockets. And we may not realize that indeed they might be stewing, agonizing over these layoffs, seeing something that we don't see, that unless they do that, everybody's going to lose their job. Well, I, I know I've sat in that, in that seat. Uh, or maybe they are being greedy, you know, but it's, it's this possible great possibility they see something we don't see, that they have a perspective we don't have. And so with God, that we tend to, in our limited human way, look at our physical lives and our physical health as those things that are most valuable. And frankly, they're not. That God indeed has other priorities. And so if he takes the lives of 185,000 Assyrians, it is for a reason that we may not understand. And he hasn't thrown them away, as we discussed last week, right? So Jesus descends. He's able to bring the gospel to 185,000 Assyrians, and they can come to eternal life, which is that which is really important. It's not the only case, right? 70,000 Israelites die under the census for David, because David's got to learn a lesson. That lesson that, David, that God is trying to teach to David and to all of us, and to who knows how many countless millions of people who have learned from it, was something that God was willing to spend 70,000 lives on and take care of them because he takes care of them too and can bring them to eternal life. Job, right? We covered the book of Job. Think of his poor kids. You know, that God allows the adversary, he allows the Satan to go out and kill all of his children, crush them to death, you know, and his servants. And we think, oh, this is terrible because we're looking at it with a different set of eyes. What God was trying to teach Job and us, what God's goal was in his love for us and for them, because he loves Job's children too, was worth more than the physical lives that were ended. And indeed, Jesus went and preached to Job's children and to his servants. So the priorities are different. And it can jar us, and it should jar us, because it helps us to start breaking our presuppositions. So those were good questions that we brought up last time about this deliverance, that yes, Judah is spared, but 185,000 Assyrians are dead. And that fits into what God is trying to do for us. So let's come back, back into Psalm 48. We'll start it from the, uh, oh, actually what I should do, I had for, almost forgotten. We should read it through from top to bottom. to get it in perspective, and then we'll start pulling it apart verse by verse. So a song, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Great is the Lord, greatly to be praised in the city of our God, his holy mountain. Beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. God in her palaces. Oops, oops let's get our page down. God in, in her palaces has made himself known as a stronghold. For lo, the kings assembled themselves. They passed by together. They saw it. They were amazed. They were terrified. They fled in alarm. Panic seized them there. Anguish as of a woman in childbirth. With the east wind you do break the ships of Tarshish. As we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of, the God, city of our God. God will establish her forever. Selah. We have thought on your loving kindness, O God, in the midst of your temple. As is your name, O God, so is your praise to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is full of righteousness. 
Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Walk about Zion. Go around her counter towers. Consider her ramparts. Go through her palaces that you may tell it to the next generation. For such is God, our God forever and ever. He will guide us until death. Okay, so there we have this psalm that's in response to this deliverance from Assyria. So let's dig into it verse by verse. As I say, last week we did talk about the background. I won't do that again. You'll see in your notes that you have the references there to 2 Kings 18.9 through 19.37 where we see the account. But again, to summarize, we see God delivering the nation. In fact, we'll see it a little later as we go through these verse by verse. You'll see when we come to Isaiah 10 how God allowed or even caused Assyria's rise intentionally to work out his will for the nation of Israel. But although he raised them up for a person, they didn't see it that way. They saw it as their dominion, as their power, and brutally overstepped their bounds. Indeed, they were a very, very cruel people. They intentionally would fill their foes with dread. So as they'd conquer a city, they'd take and impale the inhabitants all around, just to make sure that everyone was terrified of the Assyrians. They would take them off their land, make sure they were broken of all of their culture, and literally destroy them completely as a nation. So as we mentioned, here we have this oppressor coming down, attacking Judah, who had not provoked it, and God frees them by taking these lives, these 185,000 lives. And as we mentioned, we also have this difference in perspective, that just as he took the 70,000 lives, that was a lesson that was worth those 70,000 lives to him that he can deal with. The same with the 185,000 here are Job's children. So a different perspective that sets the stage for this psalm. So coming through it verse by verse, You know, a song, a psalm of the sons of Korah. As we mentioned, there are several different contributors to the psalms, and the sons of Korah are one. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. This is the shout of deliverance. You can just picture these people. They were facing certain death, deportation, torture, brutal conquest, and God just miraculously delivers them from this overwhelming foe. To be praised in the city of our God, his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth, Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. All right, so what would that mean to someone who knew the topology of Jerusalem, to someone who is aware of the area, lived in the area? Well, the, Jerusalem is rather an interesting city geologically that it's over 800 feet above sea level, and it's very near the Great Rift Valley. So, so you, have the, you have the Dead Sea dropping down to huge depths, and you have... Uh, Jerusalem and on this very high plateau. It's not necessarily the highest mountain, but it rests on one of the highest tablelands in the entire area. You know, so we have this 800 foot elevation. And Mount Zion itself, which we also believe to be the same as Mount Moriah. I don't know if Mount Moriah rings a bell to anyone, but it's where Abraham brought Isaac when he was asked to offer him why this area is so holy. Okay, Mount Zion itself is in the northeast side of Jerusalem. So that's why we have this description here of his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion, this part of Jerusalem, in the far north, it's in the northeast side of the city, the city of the great king. And if you remember when the Assyrians were attacking, what title was the king of Assyria taking? The great king. And so in this psalm, we see the right perspective of who truly is the great king. There was a title taken by the kings of the Near East, but the psalmist attribute it to God. And in fact, Jesus does himself. I don't know if it rings a bell, but you'll find it tucked away in the Beatitudes. In the Sermon on the Mount, if we go to uh, Matthew 5 and verse 35, you'll see Jesus use this term, right, where he's talking about our language. In verse 33, again, you've heard it said to the men of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great 
king. So interesting how even Jesus makes his reference to God and to the city of the great king. So, back to Psalm 48. Within her citadels, God has shown himself a sure defense. Right? So the walls weren't going to save them from the Assyrians. Their armies weren't going to save them from the Assyrians. Um, and in indeed, the Assyrians even said, we'll give you, you know, hundreds of horses, see if you can put people on them. And they, that wouldn't be able to save them. Who was the sure defense of the city? It was God himself who provided that defense. For lo, the kings assembled. They came on together. And it's interesting how he uses the term in the plural, that the kings assembled together. Because this refers to something that the Assyrians said about themselves. This is a reference I made earlier to Isaiah 10. Where God talks about Assyria. Beginning in Isaiah 10 and verse 5, he says, Ah, Assyria, the rod of my anger. So there was a purpose that the Assyrians were fulfilling. The staff of my fury against a godless nation I send him, referring to Israel, which had completely forsaken God. So God takes away his protection. And against the people of my wrath, I command him to take spoil and seize plunder and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. But he does not so intend and his mind does not think so. He doesn't see himself as God's agent. In great vanity, he sees himself as the conqueror of the world, as the great king. But it is his, it's in his mind to destroy, let's say, an incredibly cruel adversary, an incredibly cruel conqueror, to destroy and to cut off nations not a few. For he says, are not my commanders all kings? And so the kings assemble to take Jerusalem, to conquer Jerusalem. But as soon as they saw it, they were astounded, they were in panic, and they took to flight. Trembling took hold of them there, anguish as of women, a woman in travail. By the east wind you did shatter the ships of Tarshish. Both of those are interesting images that we find in, in the Old Testament and the Psalms. The east wind is one. And the east wind is often associated with destruction. So again, a couple of cross-references we can use to see how this east wind, this image of the east wind is used. Let's go to Isaiah 27 and verse 8. So if it was the east wind in Jerusalem, what was it coming off of? The desert. It's going to be a brutal, brutal wind. Okay. So here in Isaiah, breaking right into the prophecy, measure by measure by exile you did contend with them. He removed them with his fierce blast in the day of the east wind. So again, a symbol of destruction. Jeremiah 18 and verse 17. That's a typo in your notes, by the way. I think it says verse 7. It should be verse 17. Like the east wind, I will scatter them before the enemy. I will show them my back, not my face, in the day of their calamity. So again, destruction is the symbol of the east wind. And finally, back to Job, you know, that we did spend some time in. Job 27 and verse 21. The east wind lifts him up, and he is gone. It sweeps him out of his place. So the sense of destruction from the east wind. It also brings back an image from Exodus. Right? So when the Israelites are leaving Egypt and they're camped at the Red Sea, we mentioned this before, it's not quite like we saw in Cecil B. DeMille where you know, he raises his arms and the jello bowl still separates. I think it was a bowl of jello. That's how they did that special effect uh, in the Ten Commandments movie. That it wasn't quite that way. Exodus 14 verse 21 gives us a little more description. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, like the Lord told him, like you see in the movie. You know, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. So again, this image of the east wind. Now 
Then in that same verse, we have another image that we'll encounter from time to time, referring to the ships of Tarshish. What were these besides really difficult to say without tripling your tongue? The ships of Tarshish. Tarshish was probably Tartessus in southwest Spain. So quite far away, Tarshish was the end of the world. In fact, if I recall, doesn't Jonah take a ship to go to Tarshish? Uh, you know, the end of the world, way out in, in, in western Spain. And it was famed as a, as a port, and its ships were renowned as the largest of the age, according to Sonsino. And so by God destroying the ships of Tarshish, it's an image of God destroying an overwhelming of force, the greatest ships of, of its age. Yes, AC. Oops, can we get you a mic though, just so we, so we can... We can hear. It's not a no, it doesn't matter if it is. All questions are fair. It's a quote about the East Wind by Arthur Conan Doyle. Okay. Um, there's an East Wind coming all the same. Such a wind as never blew on England yet. It will be cold and bitter, Watson, and a good many of us will wither before it blasts. Mm -hmm. But it's God's own wind. Nonetheless, and a cleaner, better, stronger land will lie in the sunshine when the storm is cleared. Hmm. The east wind. Yeah, so good. Thank you for sharing it. As, as we find these analogies in our literature, which are full of them. So that's the reference to the ships of Tarshish, an overwhelming force. And by the symbolic statement of God destroying them, it's God destroying an overwhelming force. As this unstoppable Assyrian army was, that was stopped at the gates of Jerusalem. As we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God establishes forever. It's an interesting statement. What did it mean, as we have heard, so we have seen? Well, again, picture these people. They have a glorious history. There are people of a book, right, kind of unusual for the age, people who are well acquainted with, with what had been passed down to them for history. And they have heard in the past of all these miraculous, miraculous deliverances, like the Exodus, right? Miraculous deliverances of the way, miraculous deliverances under the judges. And now suddenly in their own day and age, what do they see? Just as they've heard from the past, so they've seen today that God is still this amazing God who has delivered them from an oppressor who was intent on destroying them. So as we have seen, or as we have heard, so we have now seen in the city of our God. And Sonsino makes an interesting note, and again we mentioned the Sonsino commentary is an excellent source of a Jewish perspective on the scriptures, which is a good place for us to start. We should first understand that perspective before we start understanding them as Christians, to understand the root, understand where they came from. And they say that it says, which God establishes forever is kind of a dry statement describing the city. They say it may be better rendered as an exclamation. You know, God established it forever, almost as, a, as an outburst, as a prayer, you know, that God would take and establish Jerusalem forever. Something looking back as the future, not just as something that has been done. I find this interesting in verse 10. And again, as we pray this ourselves in the office, as it becomes our prayer, um, we have thought on your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. Okay, let's look at that in a couple of ways. Again, from a Jewish perspective, from the perspective of the Psalms, remember we mentioned that love and hate are used in different ways. That we tend to think of it in terms of intent. We think of love as someone's will towards us, or as hate as someone's will towards us. Whereas in Hebrew thought, it was much more rooted in action. Okay, so, um, so good, God was good to you when he did good things. He loved you when good things happened to you. He hated you or was angry at you when seemingly bad things happened to you. Remember, all this happens to Job, and what does he say? He says, shall we receive good from the Lord and not evil as well? Now, to our mind, that's a bit strange. We think of God as evil, but to a Hebrew mind, it had to do with how you felt you were being treated at the time. Was I receiving blessings or was I receiving trials? Blessings, God loved me. Trials, 
God was angry at me or God hated me. So here in this case, in Hebrew thought, we have fought on your steadfast love, O God. Why? Because he had just delivered them. Good things had come to them. As Christians, we understand this a little differently. So we're looking more at intent. We're looking more at the heart, which is in keeping with our covenant as opposed to the old covenant. Remember, the old covenant was a very human-oriented covenant. You do this for me, I do that for you. It was geared towards humans who thought like humans. In the new covenant, it's all give. I will give you, I will write my law on your hearts, write on your minds, I will forgive your sins. It's a divine covenant geared towards people who can think and feel and act as God does. So it is more about intent, is more about our heart and our disposition. So I, I often find this a remarkable, fruitful meditation. How many deeply healing, and healing is the right word for it, healing hours I've spent in front of the tabernacle, just dwelling, thinking, on just the idea that there is a God who loves me. You know, so often we grow up in a love vacuum, that we don't often feel loved, or if we feel loved, sometimes it's almost like being, being used. Why do, why do you love me? Why do you care for me? So often we've grown up in a background where the people who were supposed to love us didn't do a very good job of loving us. Maybe from their own anger or their own hatred or their own evilness, or maybe just their own hurt. And when I say hurt, people hurt. And so, so often we grow up in this love vacuum. And to just sit there and to meditate, to talk to God about what it means that he would love us so much that despite all of our shortcomings, he would come to die for us. He would come to wait for us in the Eucharist. He would come to want to join himself to every cell of our body. He would want to be with us. He would want to make his home with us. Why would you do that for me? And there's only one answer, because I love you. And so to dwell, to think on the love of God, to do, think about what it means to be truly loved just because God loves us and for no other reason can be re a remarkable source of healing in our lives and enable us to then receive God's grace to love the same way. I remember saying to someone, they were helped so much by a prayer they heard. They were in a small group and they were passing a crucifix around and praying over it as, as a closing prayer for the night. And someone said, it was a very hard week, and the person said, God, you're everything, and I am absolutely nothing, and you love me anyway. Help me love like you. And just that simple thought puts life in perspective. You're everything, I'm nothing, you love me anyway. Help me love like you. So a beautiful meditation. We've thought on your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. And that brings us to this sense of praise. As your name, O God, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Okay, so if the ends of the earth know about God, if they really know him, and they know him as this God of love, this God of deliverance, then in turn the response is to praise. And interesting, we, we don't think as, of, we think how quickly news travels today, right? But news traveled quickly then. Remember, the Israelites came out of Egypt, and as they're coming towards the nations who are in Canaan, the nations are saying, we've heard about this. We heard what happened in Egypt. And you can bet people heard about what happened at Jerusalem and knew that this was a God who loved and cared for his people. So as your name, O God, your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with victory. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. And immediately we start thinking about people, right? Maybe the young girls in the city who are now rescued from this seeming destruction. But that's probably not the intent here. The intent is probably referring to all of the cities who, to the south of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is pretty far to the north of the nation of Judah. And so if the Assyrians were coming down and had conquered Jerusalem and just kept going, Everyone else south of Jerusalem was just dead meat. Okay. And here they were spared. Because God delivered Jerusalem, he delivered everybody south of them, all of the daughters of Jerusalem who can now rejoice because of your judgments. What judgments? 
your judgments against the people who threatened the nation of Judah unjustly and who mocked God. And his judgment was to remove them, to break their power, send them back, and spare these people who were innocent, innocently trying to follow God. Let me have this interesting statement about the towers. Walk about Zion, go round about her, number her towers. Why might that be important to the people who had just been delivered? Well, there weren't a series of towers around Jerusalem. In Ezekiel 40, we see a description of a new Jerusalem that may reflect the structure of the old Jerusalem. And it talks about, you know, 43 towers. They had gates in the city. They weren't gates like our swinging gates in our backyards. You know, these are very, very large gates where you think where you know everyone would pass through in the wall of the city. In fact, remember the psalm that talks about lift up your heads, O your gates. You know that the gates need the the gates needed to be raised up because the great king was coming in. Okay, so these were very large gates, and there were towers around them. Okay, so we had seven of them, seven towers in each of the six gates of the city, and uh, and, a, and a porch. So th there are literal towers here. And this may be a reference where it says, go around and count the towers to what the Assyrians were doing as they were coming and sizing up their siege of Jerusalem. Again, going over to Isaiah. Remember, Isaiah is contemporary with this because who did Hezekiah go to? He went to Isaiah when this was threatened. So the book of the prophet Isaiah or sections of the book of the prophet Isaiah are very contemporary with this. Isaiah 33 and verse 18. Your mind will muse on the terror. Where is he who counted? Where is he who weighed the tribute? Where is he who counted the towers? Okay, why might the Assyrians be doing that? It could be a mockery of, you know, that there's no way they're going to stand up against it, or it could be they're plotting out how they're going to conquer the city. So they're counting the towers. And so what does the psalmist say we should now go do? Unlike the Assyrians who were unsuccessful, walk about Zion, go around about her, number her towers, consider well her ramparts, go through her citadels, that you may tell the next generation that this is our God, our God forever and ever. So that, that's our, probably our reference there to going out and counting. The citadels going, referring back to the beginning of the psalm. And then in verse 15, we have this interesting statement. This is our God, our God forever and ever. He will be our guide forever. And the interesting part is that it's, in the Hebrew, we kind of lose it a little bit. Sonsino tells us that it's emphatic, that it's not just he's our guide. It's he's our guide and no one else. He is the one who guides us. Now, we have a little technical problem here at the end, kind of a weird way to end covering the psalm, but that's where we will. Uh, a, a technical note. You notice at the very end, there's a word tucked in there. That this is our God, our God forever and ever. He will be our, our guide forever. Believe it or not, that word forever is a bit of a problem. That, as it has in your notes, it literally means upon death. So God will be our guide upon death. But it might not be the word that we think it is. For example, in the Septuagint version, right, we have the Masoretic text, we have the Septuagint version, different versions of, of the Old Testament. Uh, it reads it as one word, meaning worlds or eternity. And that's kind of where we get the sense of forever. But others believe it's not even part of the text that it's a different word, that it's, it's a musical instruction. For example, is one called Almut Laban in Psalm 9, very similar to this Almut that we have forever. Or Alamot, which we see in, verse 40, in Psalm 46, which is one of these psalms that go together. Um, or what others suppose is that it is a musical direction, but it actually is part of the heading of the next psalm. So remember, the psalms weren't necessarily arranged where we had all these night neat divisions and chapters and verses. You, know, you had a scroll and you had all these psalms written on it. 
I point that out. Is that really important for our salvation? No. If you never knew this, you know, your life wouldn't be any better or any worse if you didn't know this technical detail. I just point it out so that as we study the Psalms, we recognize that the text is not always as, as firm as we would think it is, as we would like it to be. That we do have issues of understanding what exactly the text is, so we have to be careful if we are drilling down too deep and putting too much weight on a word and building an entire doctrine around it as opposed to taking it in its totality, taking the broad stroke and what we have learned um, about the Bible. All right, so I think that is all we have for Psalm 48. Any thoughts or questions on Psalm 48? I think, let's see, we're at 811, so it's probably a good time to take a break, and then we can come back and do the office after that. But ideas, thoughts, comments, perceptions. Again, we're going to pray this psalm, so it's very important. How did this speak to us? Different Bibles Sorry? Different Bibles and different Yes. Yeah, they do, because they're taking different approaches to how, what this word means. I don't have a 15. I end with uh, verse 14. Yes. And it, the last um, bit is, he will be our guide even to the end. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and that's exactly my point, and you'll see it in different translations. For example, the Revised Standard Version numbers it a little differently. So it has a verse 15 as opposed to a verse 14. We come over here, let's take a look at the end. New International, here's, here's the new IV over, NIV over here. For this is, our, this is God, for this God is our God forever and ever, he will be our guide even to the end. Over here, this is the NASB, he will guide us until death. Take a look at two more just to show the variety. I think that's just another example of nothing can be taken too literally. Yes, and why we have to be careful about doing that because we don't always have a complete understanding of what this is. Um, here's the Rotherham. He will, uh, will conduct us till death. And let's take a look at one more. Let's take a look at the Jewish Publication Society. See what that says. For such is God, our God, forever and ever, he will guide us eternally. So the same sense. But as I say, many think that this word doesn't even belong here, that it's a musical instruction and maybe belongs at the beginning of the next psalm. So that's the only caution for that. Before we break, let me just review where we're going so we're prepared for it. So we mentioned that the psalms themselves, and we're not studying just for the technical value, that we put this together with the divine office. So we'll come back in the second half, we'll turn off, off the cameras, and we'll pray the divine office. Psalms are meant to be prayed. The divine office, you'll find there's a whole section we covered on it, and there's some handouts for it, but in brief, the divine office is a public liturgy. It's where people come together to essentially pray the Psalms. Um, as I mentioned in that section, that I personally found the divine office remarkably useful because it completely changed my prayer from being this laundry list I give to God of my needs and wants and needs and wants of others, to this love song that we sing to our beloved, to help one fall in love with God, to look and meditate upon what he is and to give him the thanks and praise that comes with someone you care deeply for. I always thought that was Proverbs. Sorry? I always thought that was more Proverbs. Pro well, actually we'll find in the divine office, we often pull from other texts besides the Psalms. In fact, we'll use one tonight. That's why we had Jeremiah 31. And so the divine office is a way in the church of, in a sense, mirroring the temple worship. In the temple worship, there were the two major sacrifices in the morning and in the evening. And then there was the celebration and the praise of God that was to be sung all throughout the day and all throughout the night. And so in this way, the church prepares this office so that the praises of God are sung by his people all throughout the day and night. So there's night, there are night offices, there are day, there's the big office in the morning, there's the daytime prayer, there's the evening prayer, there's the night prayer. And so it creates this rhythm of prayer through the day. And so we'll take and we'll pull out the office and we'll use these psalms. And instead of just learning about them, we'll use them to pray in the fixed off, uh, setting of the office. And you're welcome to stay, welcome to leave for, for it, uh, however you, you would like. In the office tonight, you'll find, I have it pulled up over here, so we can view it together. 
we'll find that we'll, have, we'll be pretending we're doing the morning office, okay, as, as we learn our way through. So remember we had Psalm 95, that's where we started. The, 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 the Psalm about this praise of God and yet also a call to make sure that we listen to his voice and don't walk the other way. There's a hymn that will follow that. And then after the hymn, we start the psalm. So the first psalm will be Psalm 57, which we covered, I think, two weeks ago. Just if you want to take a review your notes during the break. Um, psalm 57. And then the psalm after that will be Jeremiah 31, 10 to 14, which we looked at last week, I believe. And then we will have Psalm 48, which is the one we just covered. And there'll be a brief reading. the responsory, and then there'll be the canticle of Zechariah that we covered, I think, two weeks ago. And that's part of the ordinary. It's always the same. Every morning office, we pray the canticle of Zechariah. Okay. Then there are some intercessions where we also can bring our own intercessions to the prayer, the Lord's Prayer, and then a concluding prayer and a dismissal. And that will be the night. So if I say, if you want to look at your notes in the break, those would be the ones, the canticle of Zechariah, Psalm 48, Jeremiah 31, Psalm 57, and Psalm 95. All right, so with that, let's break. We'll come back and we'll pray. <laughs> 